Hello, everyone. Uh, we've got lots to talk about as usual. Let's get on to it. For our top news story, the crushing climate impacts are going to hit sooner than feared. And certainly in Western Canada and the United States, we're feeling some of them right now. In technology, Toyota has announced new capabilities for domestic robots. In materials, and I don't really understand this, but the question is, are something we call Maxines the future of nanotechnology? In flight, and we've talked about China before, but they plan for a first manned mission to Mars in 2033. That's a few days off. Mm -hmm. In environment, is managed retreat a must in the war against climate change? Managed retreat, what might that mean? In biology, and this was designed apparently by a student, uh, not one of the experts, but bees now have a new life-saving vaccine to make them immune to pesty side effects. And for humans, did the ancient Maya have parks? Why would they do that? Maybe the same way we do. And then in health, apparently the mRNA vaccine provides full protection against malaria, at least that's in mice. So Richard, what's this in the top story? that crushing climate impacts are going to hit sooner than we'd fear. Now, this particular story, uh, the source of it is from the UN's climate, climate science advisors. It's only a draft report, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it's still filled with bad news. And what the UN is saying is that climate change will fundamentally reshape life on Earth in the coming decades, even if humans can tame the planet, planet warming greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, the UN is saying that trouble from climate change is coming and stopping uh, the greenhouse gas emissions wouldn't, is not going to stop the trouble that is coming. And uh, they're saying by the time uh, our grandchildren that are being born now are 30, they will be seeing species extinction, more widespread diseases, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapses, and all of that stuff within 30 years. And the further the choices societies make now will determine whether our species thrives or just survives. And there are dangerous thresholds that are closer than we thought. And continuing in the uh, mode of this report, they say the worst is yet to come, affecting our children and our grandchildren's lives much more than our own and life they're saying uh life on earth can recover from a dramatic drastic climate shift by evolving new species and creating new ecosystems earth can recover <laughs> they're not sure that humans can and there are several takeaways from this UN report. The first one 
is with <laughs> 1.1 degrees of climate warning uh, doc so far, the climate is already changing. <laughs> And you can ask people who are going through the heat wave in the West about that right now. And that more of the bad news is on our current trajectories, they say we are headed for three degrees uh, Celsius temperature change, uh, which is absolutely disastrous level. And even when we uh, get 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, heating, this is going to produce progressively serious centuries long and in some cases irreversible consequences. Examples of this are like the coral reef ecosystems dying out entirely. Uh, whatever indigenous populations you have in the Ar Arctic will also uh, die off. And things like the fire season will be longer and the potential burnable area will double. And uh, the world must face up to this reality and prepare for the onslaught. Uh, current levels of adaptation will be inadequate. Examples of this, by 2050, the coastal cities, which are on the front line of the climate, climate crisis, will see hundreds of millions of people at risk from floods and uh, storm surges and uh, the dislocation caused by the rising ocean. Uh, and the, another thing the report outlines that they're now talking about more frequently is the danger of compound and cascading impacts as one tipping point triggers another tipping point. For example, at a two degree C temperature rise, uh, that will uh, melt enough Greenland and Antarctic ice to lift ocean waters around the planet 13 meters. That's 40 feet. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh. So, uh, mm. and that that's wow. two degrees. They say if we don't do something serious, we're heading towards three degrees. And, uh, you know, there is no easy solution for this tangle of products. If you look at what's going to happen in coastal environments, uh, you're going to see places where uh, they have multiple climate catastrophes at the same time. Imagine this combination, drought, heat waves, cyclones, wildflower fires, and then flooding. Oh boy, I don't think I want to live there. So uh, well, thanks what, a lot for the good news, Richard. What, what's, what's the bad news? Uh, <laughs> the bad news is that uh, we actually can do some stuff to avoid the worst of this. And these include things that we know about like conservation and restoration of what they call the blue carbon ecosystems, which are kelp and mangrove forests. This moderates a lot of the ocean problems and absorbs a lot of CO2. The biggest thing that is here is actually transitioning to a plant-based diet. Uh, that reduces food relation emissions by uh, more than two thirds. And uh, the food system 
puts a third of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So that is reducing a significant chunk by um, more than two thirds. <clears throat> and, you know, the to me, part of the problem with this is we need transformational change operating on all kind of processes everywhere and we need to think about it seriously and do something. Any thoughts? Transition to electrical cars. Uh, I read that they have some batteries now that you can run thousands of miles on a, on a battery. Yes. Uh, that would be one solution if you get rid of all the combustion uh, engines, the cars. That would be a big That helps. Point. I think that's already baked into a lot of these forecasts. I think we've said this before, but what you said about a plant-based diet, the single best thing one person can do is go to a plant-based diet. And as an aside, one of my pet peeves is when I go out to dinner with one of my fellow uber liberal friends and they order with great joy a big, fat, juicy steak. I, I have in the past bit my tongue. I think in the future, I'm not going to bite my tongue anymore. It's just, you know, if you're going to get a damn steak, buy it and eat it at home. When you go out to eat, restaurants have good alternatives to big, fat, freaking steaks. <laughs> buy your own damn steak at home, I say. Now, uh, my wife and I, after <laughs> watching a uh, Netflix film, which I can't remember its name of, it was focused on uh, world-class athletes uh, who had converted to plant-based diets. And one of the guys they showed was this big, hunky guy who uh, st established a world lifting uh, record where he lifted more than a thousand pounds and carried it over 30 feet, and he's been on a plant-based diet for years. And so these, uh, there is also a football team, the Titans, I think, that had done poorly for years, and their trainer put them all on a plant-based diet, and they got in the playoffs. Uh, so anyway, it's right? The game, is, is it the game changers? Yes. Yes, uh, yes, I've seen I, a lot I, of I, things I, on converting to a plant-based diet, and the game changer for me was the thing that had the most personal effect. Carol and I now, uh, our current system that we're just starting is three days a week on a plant-based diet. Uh, that already will get you some of the benefits, and it'll uh get significant cardiovascular benefits. Uh, I have an issue with kidney disease and everything that I read now says even with kidney disease, uh, the nephrologists are encouraging plant-based diets as well, even though the protein sources in a plant-based diet like beans are ones that I've learned to avoid. <clears throat> You know, one thing about this um, particular article that you've got here, Richard, is you notice a trend now that the, uh, the green information is admitting that uh, we aren't going to win this uh, um, race to limit climate change right. or to yes. limit temperature rise. And what they're starting to do is address these previously politically incorrect topics like adaptation and population control. And what this is, this is just the thin edge of the wedge. And what we're gonna see more and more is that the decision makers already know that it's a lost battle, but what they're doing is uh, still remaining optimistic and trying to keep people on board. But gradually over the next five years, we'll see more of this message that we're going to have to adapt and that uh, sea levels will rise and coastal populations will be threatened. And there are going to be massive um, uh, 
environmental refugee movements and the need to uh, deal with those. And uh, we're just going to see more and more of this in the uh, media as they uh, kind of inoculate us with these ideas. Yes, uh, I have one of those in uh, our article for today talking about managed retreat. And I had never seen that word in the media until a few weeks ago. And now I've seen it several places. You know, yeah. so just exactly what you're saying here, we're starting to hear a different story. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm pessimistic about the future, regardless of what we do. And I think the planet, to put it in a bigger, more philosophical perspective, the planet has gone through five major extinctions, complete life extinctions on the planet five times in the last 500 million years. And we are on the trajectory for a sixth extinction. The only good news is our generation probably won't see it. Like we will all be gone. That's right. It's, uh, they're talking about uh, this UN report is talking about 30 years away. And so I'm 77 and I think the odds are I will not live to be 107. <laughs> and you know, the thing is, the like I'm sure Clive and Andrew and all will agree with me, regardless of what we do and even revolutionary technologies, uh, 7 billion people, soon to be 9 billion, cannot, uh, all aspiring for a higher standard of living simply is not sustainable, regardless of what technology comes up with. That's what makes me very darkly pessimistic. I think we mm -hmm. underestimate the inventions coming. You know, a lot of problems we have had are being solved by new technology, new ideas. The younger generations, they build on our shoulders. They see these problems and they will come up with new solutions. Uh, I think. Well, we have a lot that is in the pipeline now and a lot of new uh, developments. Uh, I am now, my concern with this technology, I agree with what you're saying, Johannes, but what we need to start seeing is uh, some of this wonderful technology being rolled out and put into general use. Right now, the stuff we hear about is in labs or in uh, product development. It's not in being released to the market yet. Well, electric cars are well on their way. And yes, they are. Yes, value. they are. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of things. You know, really... I, I beg to differ. A little bit. I, I don't want to get into an argument here. We can do that <laughs> offline over a beer. <clears throat> but I think... <laughs> I think the problem is electric cars need electricity and electricity is, has to be produced from a source. And if you take the total amount of energy consumption that mankind, and I, I worked in the energy industry for 40 years, as did Andrew. If you convert it to megawatts or you convert it to megawatt hours or whatever unit you want, to generate that much from clean sources is a staggering, uh, staggering uh, it's almost a vertical wall of challenges. It, it's not easy. Even if you go to electric cars, the electricity has to come from the grid. And right. currently, the grid is less than half a percent is carbon friendly. No. Put solar cells on your on your roof. You'll get a lot of electricity from that. You can do all that. But to totally run your entire economy on renewable energy is not realistic. That's all I'm saying. So if we want to move on, what's this about new capabilities for robots announced by Toyota? Now, this often in this segment, I talk about EVs and stuff like this, but uh, I think robots certainly qualify as new technology. And uh, Toyota has announced that they have developed new capabilities for their line of domestic robots. And uh, Japan is a place where particularly they are working on these domestic robots. Japan has one of the oldest population mixes in the world, 
and expects by 2040, which is not that far from now, that they they will have as many people over 65 as under 65. So this they really see a crisis coming in Japan. And so a number of Japanese robotic companies have been working to build robots that will be able to uh, help these people as uh, they get older. And so what uh, Toyota is one of the leading companies in this Japan uh, robots for the elderly business. And so now uh, their domestic robot, which they have not given any cute name, what kind of marketing is that? We at least expect a cute name for the robot, but their robots, uh, what they have done is solve a particularly dif difficult kind of AI object recognition problem. And where now the robots are able to see and manipulate transparent items. And it turns out being able to see and manipulate transparent items has been a real problem for these domestic robots. And so now uh, their domestic robot can, uh, you know, clean the table, move the glasses around and do all of those things. I got a short video from Toyota to watch and uh, this is a marketing uh, video. In the middle of it, notice that the robot picks up a smartphone and takes a selfie to demonstrate how clever it is. Here we go. I don't see anything, by the way. Well, I'm sharing it. I don't know. Anybody else don't see? There it's cleaning the table oh, yeah, and yeah. picking up a glass. Yeah. It's not a video, it's just static pictures. Uh, yeah, anyway, I was running a video. I'm turning it off now. Anyway, uh, so uh, the robots they're trying to see in our future, so far they can do things like sweep floors, vacuum carpets. Uh, some of the robots can even fold clothes. <laughs> Uh, these robots certainly can clear your dinner table and pick up the dishes and put them in the sink. They don't have it yet for they put them in the dishwasher, so I don't know what good are they yet. And uh, But they are trying to make the robots more be able to fit in to a person's life and give an old person the kind of assistance they might need. And uh, right now, the price is not set for these robots, but uh, Toyota is talking about a plan to rent them for uh, $225 a month. And I don't know, $225 a month to rent a, a robotic maid doesn't sound like a bad deal to me. So as long as the robot can go up and down stairs, well, I you, have them Mexico, at my place. You can get about Here in Mexico, you, for, for that kind of money, you can rent 
to life robots, to life rates. <laughs> Richard, uh, you know if uh, China is working on robots like that, because they have the same problem as Japan with the population getting older and older. So it would be a concern for them too. I'm sure they are. I haven't heard much about the Chinese robotic industry, but I'm sure they are. Actually, there's a backstory to this, but it's more sociological than technological. The Japanese were offered uh, uh, th tens of thousands of Filipino nurses, fully highly trained Filipino nurses to service all their retirement homes. But the Japanese tend to be quite ethnocentric and have a yes. very difficult time dealing with other ethnic groups or, and they, they turned it down and said, we would rather have Japanese robots than Filipino nurses. Yes. <laughs> so that, that started all this technological revolution. Yes. <laughs> so Richard, moving on from robots, what's this thing about vaccines being the future of nanotechnology? Well, uh, I know that you guys love all my 2D material stories. Uh, this is the edge of technology, and that's why I keep reporting it. Uh, Maxines were a kind of real thin material, not necessarily the same kind of 2D material as graphene, because there may be more layers than graphene but uh, they are still just a few layers of atoms. And uh, what they have found in the last few years is that some of these materials have unusual properties like high electrical conductivity, strength, and ability to conduct heat. And by using layers of these materials, they can solve a problem with the 2D material that they can't solve otherwise. And that is to use, they want to use the 2D materials as the basis for technology like semiconductors. But to do it, you need layers that are good conductors and graphene is not a good enough conductor. And so what uh, most of the vaccines they have have a uh, combine some metal, some good conductor with other layers that have other properties. And uh, so <coughs> this combination and including a conductive layer really opens the door to these new applications at the nanometer uh, scale. There already are applications that are close to realization that use this technology. One of them are efficient energy storage uh, in terms of batteries and supercapacitors. I think we've been hearing about those already that are graphene based and are able to either hold more charge or charge much faster. Uh, in the long term, we're going to hear about uh, use in areas like uh, air and water purification and uh, as antennas for the next generation of communication. And it also turns out these vaccines are biocompatible and with many of them that are non-toxic and eco-friendly and it looks like they are studying them for the formation of artificial kidneys. And so uh, they discovered the first vaccine about 10 years ago. It's titanium carbide. Now they have identified about 50 others. So the library of these materials is going up. And they say, uh, that the number of combinations 
might be almost infinite, they think in the long term there will be thousands of different vaccines with different tailored properties. So it's one of the kind of materials that is likely that uh, the new technologies will be built upon. Some map. So let's get on to space. And what's this about China once again with a manned mission to Mars in 2033? Well, China has big plans in space. And uh, this is just a continuation of things that we have been hearing recently. So China has announced their plans to send its first crewed mission to Mars in 2033. And it's really part of a long-term plan to build a permanently inhabited base on Mars and then to be able to extract its resources. If you've been paying attention to China in the last 20 years, one of the things that they've been doing is going around the earth and making different deals to extract the resources of different countries around the earth. They have got a substantial position in rare earths as an example of that. And I think they're extending their strategy into space. So they're going to Mars not as a bit of scientific exploration and advancement of humankind, but they're going to it to uh, mine it and bring all the good stuff back to Earth. And so this is an ambitious plan, and it's going to intensify the China-U.S. race in space. And China now uh, plans more crude launches to Mars uh, basically every two years after 2033. Every two years, the Mars and the Earth are close together, so they're planning more uh, missions with uh, crews in 2033, 2035, 2037, 2041. And before these manned missions begin, China will send robots to Mars to identify sites to build their base and to start to build systems to extract resources. When people live on Mars, they're going to need water and oxygen and other material. And the plan that China has, and I'm sure the plan that the US has, is to start putting those things on the planet before the people are there so they will have air to breathe and water to drink. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has been also developing technology to go to Mars, and they've announced a goal sometime in the 2030s. They haven't announced more specifics than that. I think the Chinese announcements will spur a U.S. announcement. And then uh, China, their real Mars plan uh, envisions fleets of spacecraft shuttling between Earth and Mars to bring all this material back. So they're uh, planning not just a mission, but a fleet to be able to ferry the extracted materials from Mars back to Earth. And so uh, China is into space, and I would say the real competition for space is now underway. So what do you guys think? I didn't hear Fred. I, per, per the first story, I have two words to say, not happening. 
I think that I think the first story trumps what you're talking about. I, I just I'm not buying this Mars crap. I don't know. I just can't. It's not possible. I, it's insane. Am I the only? No, oh, I, I would tend to agree with you, Clifford. Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. And also the whole attitude is almost like the colonial Portuguese and Spaniards, basically to loot the place, not like Captain Cook, to go research and find out about this place. <laughs> yeah, but the, at least at least they, they found things to loot. I mean, the idea that we're going to loot Mars, this barren wasteland, <laughs> we, we, we've, we've got to figure out the problem number one that you discussed in the first story. It's, that's just a hundred times more uh, it's potentially solvable. Like Johanna says, it's conceivable, maybe it's a long shot that we can fix these huge problems, but going to Mars, well, I, I just don't get it. I just, I'm sorry. I just, it sounds crazy to me. I just, not possible, I don't think. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. There are Anybody? military benefits that uh, they look for. And a lot of this stuff is just done under the guise of exploration, when in reality it's to perfect military systems. That could be, yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah. Some of it is bombast and uh, <clears throat> um, exaggeration also possibly. And yeah, national yeah. marketing. Right. Right, it's like the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. whoop de do your, your runner, what was the fastest run in the world? And, it's PR, but it doesn't do anything. It, it, I mean, there might be some secondary benefits, like you know, the, the earlier space races where we have developed uh, all kinds of great technology. That's the one baton potential uh, the, side. The, pro the problem is because China is a closed society; it won't be shared with mankind. <laughs> it's a very closed and inbred society, so it's not. They're not going to share it. They're really trying to get like global monopoly in technology development and everything else. So if they're not an open society like the U.S. is. So, you know, I mean, the space race did give a tremendous amount of spin-off benefits. Every, everything from the computer chip to a lot of other things. And uh, uh, But it was openly shared. It was open architecture. And it, uh, it had a lot of follow-on benefits that I'm not sure the Chinese will be prepared to share with their adversaries or other peoples. Except as a customer, right? They'll we sell need to them get to some us. hot science participants from Beijing. <laughs> well, they haven't heard about us yet. Maybe they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possible. <laughs> we'll know if VJ doesn't make it to the next couple. Okay, that's, that's right. Nice. He said critical <laughs> words. On to something you all. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. here we are. You made reference to this next one about manage retreat. Yes, the. Uh... They're now starting to say this is uh, a researcher at the University of Delaware who is a disaster researcher. He says it's time to put all the options on the table when it comes to discussing climate change adaptation. And he used this adapt word. And Manage retreat is what he's talking about, and managed retreat is the purposeful movement of people, buildings, and systems from vulnerable areas to safe areas. Managed retreats so far has mainly been considered as a last resort, and they're saying uh, we should start considering it. So I think that's speaks to how dire the actual situation is. And uh, what they will, climate change is affecting people all over the world and everyone is trying to figure out what to do. This one potential strategy though, which is moving away from hazards could be very effective 
but it's often overlooked. And this guy wants us to start looking at it seriously. Here are some examples of what he is talking about. And uh, here are some examples of managed retreat. Now I hear an echo there and can you mute yourself if you're not talking so the echo will go away. Anyway, this slide gives some examples of what they mean. In the uh, upper left corner is a place where they consolidated the city away from the danger zone. The example in the middle is elevated. They raise the city up out of the danger area. That, of course, will be tremendously expensive. The example on the upper right is a floating city to put part of the city in a floating environment. Uh, that's also going to be an enormous project. Maybe it's cheaper than elevating your city. Down in the lower left, they show a walled resistance system. Uh, I suspect building walls when you don't know whether the ocean rise is going to be 10 feet or 100 feet is not a very good solution. Then they show a hybrid solution. They don't really explain what's all involved. It looks like part of it is rised up and then they've made channels for the water to move in and out and things like that. So they're, they're saying there are different ways that uh, we can approach this problem and we need to do something. And if you look at it, managed retreat already has been happening in the U.S. for many years, but at a small scale. Uh, after Hurricanes Harvey and Florence, then uh, there is uh, people seeking and getting government support for relocation. Around the Delaware coast, they've used buyouts to remove homes and families from flood prone areas. So we're already doing it now. And if the only tools you can think about are things like building up the beaches and building walls, you really are limiting what you can do. But if you start adding things to the toolkit, then there are more options that may be a better long-term adaptation. Uh, these things all require uh, time. And if you're going to do them, we need to start talking about them and planning them. Communities are making decisions right now that affect the future that are zoning decisions, they're making decisions to build seawalls and things like that. And while you're making these decisions to spend all this public money, uh, this author is suggesting that maybe we take a bigger look, remove the blinders and try to figure out what is a 50 year solution not a 10 year solution. Buildings in that kind of infrastructure have a typical life of 50 to 100 years. So why don't we actually plan for that uh, time span? And they point out that the US particularly is in a privileged position to be able to deal with this stuff because there is available space to move to, money and resources to be able to uh, deal with this. There are a lot of places in the world where they have no space and their money is limited. So America has an opportunity that most of the rest of the world doesn't have.
So it's, I guess, up to us to get them to do it. Any thoughts? I think this is a solution for rich countries. But if we all get safer and we watch the, the, the rest of the developing world uh, drown and be miserable, uh, is that going to be any good? Well, that's the biggest challenge that we really face is convincing liberals that uh, there are going to be significant fractions of the world population that are going to have to be abandoned. It's the lifeboat problem. And, uh, and, and it's going to be difficult. There's no doubt about it. I, I think it's easier to move people to somewhere that's safe rather than making an existing place safe. <laughs> right. That's what the argument I is. I want to defend liberals and, and not suggest that it's a liberal political thing. It's a game theory problem. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, we need to convince liberals. We need to convince people to, you know, understand the economics of the problem, which doesn't, isn't a liberal or conservative issue. I don't think necessarily there, Andrew. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it makes sense, but I think the conservatives have already abandoned the poor people in the world, and it's the liberals who uh, <laughs> have, haven't yet done that. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I would say like from a liberal standpoint or from a progressive standpoint, there are win-win situations, for example, and that's not a, abandoning poor people. For example, if you provide housing, housing for poor people, it pays for itself, and studies have shown that. So, I mean, every problem is different, and I'm not sure I'd put this in a liberal conservative thing, but I, I understand what you're saying. Well, something uh, dramatic sorry, has uh, something dramatic has to happen, uh, like uh, like the flooding of a large city. People, uh, unless they can swim, you know, down uh, by the thousands, and then maybe the uh, part of the world will wake up and start doing something. You, usually, it's a little too late. Uh, VJ, you were going to say something, but you have to unmute your uh, microphone. I was saying the list of uh, offered habitats did not offer Ahihik. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ahihik is protected from the ocean rise. That's right. <laughs> well, we're slightly above the level of the ocean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed that the author of this, or the researcher, was going to be giving a keynote speech at, uh, at a conference at Columbia. I think from June 22nd through 25th. So I went on to do a Google search to find out whether there was any reaction to uh, that keynote speech. And it, it does seem as though there was. I mean, I saw it was picked up by Reuters and a few other major outlets. And I think that's what really needs to be happening is that people really need to hear about this and it needs to get out into the mainstream media because obviously it's a question of public policy, which yes. means that gosh, you're probably going to have to sell another infrastructure bill. Yes, at least. I don't know or what kind of infrastructure bill you Richard need Moody. to be able to move New York City. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. No. Well, if, uh, uh, if we need managed retreat in the war against climate change, and we're not immune to all these. What is this about bees that they now have a vaccine to make them immune to things? What's that? Well, one of the things that I've been hearing about for years is the uh, reduction in bee populations around the world. And I don't think they know everything that's going on that is causing it. But one thing they do know is that uh, pesticides, you know, these chemicals that are designed to kill insects, then kill bees too. 
And so here, a Cornell student, James Webb, not a grad student, not a researcher, not a postdoc, but a, just an ordinary student. He figured that since our most important pollinators are regularly exposed to lethal pesticides, there ought to be something to do about it. He says, maybe we should talk about a bee vaccine. And this student did more than just talk. He invented one. And this is a pollen size microparticle containing a compound that neutralizes malathion, which is one of the most commonly used and toxic pesticides. He's marketing it as bee immunity, bee immunity and uh, it, he's marketing it to beekeepers as a supplement and vaccine. And uh, he demonstrated in a study that uh, this supplement or vaccine prevented 100% of the bee deaths from malathion, whereas the survival rate in bees that were exposed to malathion in the control group that didn't get this, their survival rate was 0%. And so uh, this particle contains an enzyme that enters the digestive system of the bees and breaks down malathion before it reaches the bee's brain. He thinks that he's going to be able to develop other uh, bee vaccines against pesticides. And he says, so far, uh, we have not found one pesticide that can't be captured by this technology. Webb says, I always thought there was a lot of research going into seeing if bees were dying and the extent to which they were dying, but not really many solutions. Anyway, this college student has created a whole new class of solutions to help preserve the bees. Any thoughts? Yay. It's, it's a little bit like uh, they've created uh, corn plants that can resist uh, Roundup to kill the weed. So we have Roundup ready corn. Maybe we'll have Malathion ready bees. <laughs> well, this student is somewhat like Bill Gates, isn't he? I mean, he, he never, he was just a regular student too. And he uh, formed Microsoft. He never, never graduated, I believe. Yeah. And to me, one of the things about this story is this shows uh, the impact of individual action. So this uh, man uh, had some idea and turned this idea of bee immunity into action and figured out how to do something about it. One of the kinds of stories that I have periodically is of this individual action that actually brings about outstanding results. I think this is one. Yeah. Well, Richard, moving on to people like us, anthropologically speaking, maybe, did the ancient Maya have parks? Now, uh, this was a study that was done of uh, pollen they found in the Maya city of Tikal. And Tikal was a bustling metropolis and homes to tens of thousands of people. And much of uh, the city was paved except around 
the water sources, it turns out, they have done DNA analysis of plant pollen in uh, the sediment around these Mayan water uh, courses and been able to identify more than 30 different species, trees, grasses, vines, and flowering plants that lived along the banks of these waterways. And, uh, you know, Tikal could get pretty hot during the dry season, so it would make sense that they would keep places that would be uh, nice and cool, and by the water system was a good place to do this. And so uh, one of the things is the Mayans were really uh, people that came from the forest. And when they went into the cities, they took a bit of the forest with them. And here they were allowed these embankments to the canals, for example, to remain as undisturbed forests. The reason they think it was undisturbed forest is one of the kinds of pollens they found was from a kind of tree that grows to a hundred feet. And for these big trees to be around the waterways means that when they built the system, the cities and these water systems, they left the trees. That to me shows something about the way in which they uh, thought about things. So as they moved into the big city, they left a portion of the forest intact. I think we could learn from the Mayans in that way. And the Mayans were a forest culture. So having the city that has a sacred grove next to the sacred spring in the heart of the city makes a lot of sense for the Mayans. And the Mayan cities as a whole were very green. One of the things that it doesn't say here, but another research article that I had in this week's Weekly Science was uh, the sociologists have also done studies on parks and cities. And what they have found overall is the more parks in the city, then the happier are the people. So when I read this article, I think that part of what the Mayans were doing was building a city in a way to make the people happy. Now that seems remarkably civilized. <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, the only thing I only thought I would offer there is again a bit on the negative side. I did a Mayan trail and went to five different countries where there were Mayan cities and they'd all collapsed and the Mayans had moved out of the area. And uh, when I asked the guide and the interpreter as to why the Mayans collapsed, he said it was because of environmental damage. Like right. what happened was the, the population of the cities grew too large and they were not able to support it and the economy kind of caved in. Right. And the, uh, the Mayans were not destroyed by an external force. They were destroyed internally. It was also connected to that was a long-term drought which really affected uh, the corn crop, which was the main food source. So uh, there was environmental issues that also led to their demise. That's right. They didn't really, de the demise was not of the, civiliz the civilization, but the Mayan people still are around. Yes. And they are in uh, many part, many countries today. Yes. Yeah. So Richard, if we want to move on to our last story, what's this about the mRNA vaccine yielding protection against malaria, albeit in mice? What's that? Now, this is from uh, 
developments from scientists from Walter Reed working with researchers from the University of Pennsylvania and a technology company, Acutas Therapeutics, and they have developed a novel mRNA uh, vaccine that protects against malaria. This is so far just in mice, but malaria is an enormous problem. It affects more than 200 million people a year with more than 400,000 deaths. It particularly uh, puts at risk pregnant women and children under five. Uh, so it has an enormous impact on the people that it does kill. Again, most of them are pregnant women and little babies. And they've been trying to find a safe and effective malaria vaccine for a long time and really have had things that looked like a promising candidate but didn't pan out. <laughs> and the recent successes with vaccines against uh, COVID-19 shows the advantage of these mRNA-based platforms, uh, which the two most significant are a highly targeted design and then flexible and rapid manufacturing, so you have the ability to produce it, uh, like the uh, COVID mRNA vaccine, what the vaccine does is go into your system and makes your system uh, build pieces uh, that, of the organism that uh, causes malaria, and then your body builds up a defense against the malaria. And so far they've achieved high level protections of against malaria infection in mice, but of course more work is done. Uh, we have to do clinical testing, but the results so far are very encouraging and malaria is one of the things around the world that causes uh, profound problems, so there's hope there. Any thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, one of the things about uh, these um, uh, mRNA vaccines is it's a relatively new technique and they still need quite a bit of time to trial these vaccines before they're officially approved and the ones that we're using now i believe have been uh, kind of exempted from the full trials that would normally be used on they've, vaccines. they've got emergency approvals yeah so really one of the areas that needs attention is a faster method of trialing these things so that they can be determined safe and uh, minimal side effects uh, far quicker than we're currently able to do. Oh, now there's one other category of people who are highly susceptible to malaria, and those are what they call naive visitors. So, you know, when Carol and I first went to India, we, because of malaria, had to put mosquito nets around our bed and uh, deal with all those things. We were paying good attention there. There are a lot of tourists in places like that that don't take those precautions, and then they're very much exposed to the risk of malaria. Yeah, the traditional malaria prevent is more of a preventative than a cure type thing. Right. With the mosquito nets and uh, avoidance, long sleeve shirts. In um, fact, uh, Bill Gates has been spending a lot of money and time trying to develop a vaccine for malaria, and he hasn't come, on, come up with one. Yes. I mean, his foundation. 
So uh, again, it must be a they tough a problem. problem. There yeah. was some place in Africa, a uh, uh, one of these uh, non-governmental organizations was making uh, nets available to the locals to uh, control mosquitoes, and they were using them to make uh, bridal uh, gowns <laughs> and veils and things like this, rather than uh, uh, go yes. with the malaria prevented. That's the way it goes. And, and apparently, one of the most effective um, uh, things that you can donate to anywhere are the organizations that are providing malaria nets. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah, some malaria nets. Bridal, that... bridal outfits. There are some malaria and nets bridal also outfits. that have that have insecticide coating on the outside so if the mosquito lands on them it'll kill them i don't know how those are for weddings yeah. <laughs> i don't know whether there was something you were going to say yeah yeah if you if the those uh, nets that have been, uh, obnoxious substances on the outside, you have to make sure you don't put them up the wrong way. <laughs> well, I know in India, uh, after we struggled and got the net over the bed the first night, when I woke up in the morning, my arm was all bloody because I had it uh, next to the net and the mosquitoes bit me through the net. <laughs> well, Richard, thanks a lot for this again, and thanks to everybody for participating, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Okay. Bye. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Adios. Bye-bye.